Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Gary Segura. I am the Dean of the Luskin School of Public Affairs here at the University of California, Los Angeles. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you tonight to um, the speaker's lecture series tonight entitled California Exceptionalism. In a moment, I'll introduce you to tonight's very fine speakers. <clears throat> and I look forward, as you do, to their uh, conversation, which I think is going to be fascinating and really examine what makes this state a different place in the context of a country that's evolving perhaps a little faster than some of us counted on. At the Luskin School of Public Affairs, we like to say we put the public back in public higher education because the 575 social workers, urban planners, and public policy professionals that we train at the Luskin School devote 100% of their attention to real world social, economic, political, and community problems, focusing on issues such as housing, transportation, human trafficking, prostitution, child welfare, HIV transmission, and the list goes on. We have clusters of experts focusing on mass incarceration and the challenges we can offer to that broken regime. On housing affordability, perhaps the California issue of the 21st century. To transportation, which since I have to drive to Palm Springs tonight, turns out to be the Gary Segura issue of February the 8th. At the Luskin School, we try to believe that we create change agents. We look forward in the next fall to launching our undergraduate major, uh, God willing. And, uh, and at that point, we hope to be training at build out about 600 undergraduates who themselves will go forward to work in the community to make California a better place to live. So we're particularly pleased tonight to be able to join in welcoming you here. And so on behalf of the Chancellor Jean Block and the Provost Scott Waugh, Again, it is my pleasure to welcome you to UCLA, now the nation's finest institute of public higher education. <laughs> Frankly, it always was. It just takes a while for the magazines to catch up. <clears throat> now let me talk about our esteemed panelists. I start with my colleague in Chicano Studies, Judy Baca, who I met for the first time tonight. Our paths just haven't crossed since I've been here. And that's because Judy Baca is one of the busiest people I've ever heard of and now met. Judy is a muralist, a monument builder, and perhaps most importantly, a professor of Chicano and Chicano Studies and of World Arts and Culture here at UCLA. Ms. Baca is per perhaps best known for the mural, The Great Wall of Los Angeles, which is located at the Tohunga Wash, a flood channel in the San Fernando Valley. Her murals span the Los Angeles region and reflect the lives of the disenfranchised and marginalized, such as women, the working poor, youth, elderly, LGBT Americans, and immigrant communities. Seated at the end here is my colleague Peter Sellers from the school uh, from, excuse me, a theater director from UCLA World Arts and Culture and Dance. He's a distinguished professor here and has gained international renown for his groundbreaking and transformative interpretations of artistic masterpieces and for collaborative projects with a range of creative artists. He has staged operas across the country and the world and worked with the likes of John Adams, the Finnish composer Kaja Saraiho, I probably butchered that name, sorry. The Berlin Philharmonic, the London Symphony, and the flex dance pioneer, Reggie Gray. Our third guest tonight perhaps needs no introduction. A native of Canada, Frank Geary studied at that other institution in LA. <laughs> I'm, I'm confused, there's another institution in Los Angeles? Before opening his own practice, Frank Geary and Associates Incorporated, founded in 1962. Mr. Geary's works, which have a distinctive style that's recognized the world over, include the Walt Disney Concert Hall in downtown Los Angeles, the Dancing House in Prague, the Guggenheim Museum in Spain, 
And in 2016, President Obama awarded Frank Gehry the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Medal of Freedom the nation's highest civilian honor. And finally, our moderator who will take over the program for the remainder of the evening, and that is the Speaker of the California State Assembly, the Honorable Anthony Rendon. Speaker Rendon represents the 63rd Assembly District in the California State Assembly, which includes nine distinct cities in southeastern uh, Los Angeles County. He was sworn in as the 70th Speaker of the Assembly in March of 2016. In his two years as Speaker, California has been at the forefront of progressive policy change, passing the nation's first $15 minimum wage. And that deserves a round of applause. In addition, the Speaker had directed the extension of climate change reduction goals, groundbreaking policies on gun and tobacco use, and investments in the transportation infrastructure and affordable housing. The Speaker is a friend of the University of California. It's a privilege to welcome him here. Please join me in welcoming all four of our distinguished panelists, and I'll turn the, the mic over to the Speaker. How about now? How about now? Now it's on? Good. They told me the orange light would go on, and I'm colorblind, so it's, it's a, a bit difficult for me. But welcome. It's a, a pleasure to be here. I've, uh, as, as the dean said, we've been exploring this idea of, of California and what it means to be a Californian. And it seems, at least to me anyway, uh, that there's been no time quite like today, quite like today quite like the last 14 months anyway, to really uh, dive in and explore uh, this topic. The Dean talked about some of our accomplishments, the, the, the uh, extension of, uh, of our climate change uh, goals was something that we did about seven days after uh, President Trump decided to pull out of the Paris Accords. Uh, we talked about uh, the fact that we passed the five most restrictive gun control bills in the history of the United States. Those were done a couple of days after the, the US Department of Justice decided uh, that certain, uh, certain gun control, uh, federal gun control pieces of legislation uh, needed to end. So it seems as though there's this incredible contrast between what's happening in Washington, what's happening in so many of the other states, versus what's happening here in California. So this idea, there's always been this sort of rendering of California as different from the rest of the country, and it's something that's always interested me, but it seems as though there's, no, there, there's been no time uh, better to discuss that uh, than there is now. I've, uh, when you have uh, this job, you get to meet a lot of interesting people, artists and, and producers and architects, and I've noticed that my personal frustration is I'm, I'm always excited to meet these people, and they always want to talk to me about politics. Um, and for me, uh, to be with these uh, people who I admire and respect and, and have admired and respected for so long, is it's an exciting opportunity for, for us to talk about, about California and what California means. They're all Californians. Uh, they have all spent significant time here. Um, and they all understand, I think, in their own way, what, what California means to them. And that's part of what I wanted to talk about tonight. That's, that's really the theme of what I wanted to talk about tonight. Uh, about 20 years ago, I became really obsessed with, uh, with Dadaism and futurism when I was in graduate school. The, the, the Dadaists and the futurists and their, their ideas about the, the sort of the, the um, the moment that they were living in and how important that moment was and what they wanted to do in that particular moment, that sense of immediacy was so important to them. And when I was in graduate school, I wrote a lot about Dadaism and futurism as, as movements. Um, last year on election night, very late at night, uh, when the national results came in and, and we again saw this great distinction, this very clear distinction between what California seemed to be saying about, about an inclusive society, what California seemed to be saying about multiculturalism, what California seemed to be saying about democracy itself 
versus what a lot versus what a lot of the rest of the country seemed to be saying. I I started writing. I uh, I started writing, and the piece that I ended up writing was a, a piece that got a, a bit of attention. Uh, the pro tem of the Senate and I published that piece the next day. And it reminded me a lot of the writings of, of the Dadaists and the Futurists. It, what I wrote that night wasn't a manifesto by any means. I, I wish it had been. Um, it wasn't quite a manifesto, but it did have that sense of immediacy, I think, and that sense of, of sort of grasping that moment, and also that sense of, of, of frustration with the way that things were. And over the course of the past year, I've continued to sort of read about the, that period of about 100 years ago when the, there were so many wonderfully uh, exciting aesthetic uh, movements that were happening. My good friend Marjorie Perloff is here. Uh, Marjorie is one of, my, one, of my, uh, one of the people who, when I read art history, she's one of the people I always sort of uh, cling to and read first. She always, in her books, she talks about moments more than she talks about movements. Her most famous book about futurism isn't called The Futurist movement, it's called the futurist moment. And she talks always, she always talks about art as, a, as not a collection of, of like-minded artists or a genre that's where everything is sort of similar. She talks about moments when all of these forces seem to be colliding in a certain place and at a certain time. And for me, what I want to explore tonight with these incredible artists is, is this, this moment that we have in California. I don't know that in a, in a society such as ours, we're quite capable of having a movement or that we've quite discovered what that movement is. But I think it's pretty clear that we're having a moment right now. We're having a California moment when we're all sort of looking at ourselves and realizing that there are forces, some forces outside of ourselves, but certainly some forces within that are converging at this moment. And for me to be able to, to talk about that with, with these people is exceptionally exciting. So uh, I do know that when you walked in, they passed out some cards. And uh, you're free to uh, write out a question on the cards. And I think someone from my staff will walk around. They'll probably wave at some point and hand it over. And we'll, we'll try to do some questions near the end. But I get, a, I get to start by asking the questions, which is exciting. Um, and the first question is an easy one. Uh, it's just sort of the open things up. Uh, so it's, it's to all three of you. What does it mean to be a Californian, but especially what does it mean to be a Californian now? And what does it mean to be a Californian now who's an artist? <laughs> is there one microphone? Okay. Okay. Am I... Am I Hi, here? Good. Okay. Um, that isn't as easy as um, you would say, an easy question. It really isn't uh, um, something that you automatically say, Californian, this is what it looks like. Um, as a Californian artist, as a Los Angeles artist, I, I come from uh, a city, for example, with diasporas from everywhere in the world, the largest numbers of people from everywhere in the world. I live in a place where there's fusions between these people and inventions at the, at the spur of the moment because there's a cross-pollinization between Latinos and Koreans or African Americans and, and you know, in my own family, I, I come from a family of musicians and I don't know how I became a painter, but I'm the only one. <laughs> but I came from the, um, jazz musicians. And I was born in Watts. So I am exact, exactly an example of, uh, of a person who came through these cross-pollinizations. And it, it actually developed my thought as an artist, made me an artist that began to look at these differences and the connections between us. And so I see California as this place where the light is magnificent, that it is a, it's weather that means that you can paint year-round outside. It's a place where um, people desire to come. I live in Venice, California, with an arts community. Uh, um, Frank and I share that. We both came from Venice for periods of time, and our paths crossed and, uh, early on. And um, uh, so I'm a Californian in the sense that I 
am an example of the diversity of this place and the cross-pollinization of it. That's good. Can I do it? That good? So, um, I forget what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I came here from Canada in, I was 17, a truck driver, but um, when I became an architect and, and um, started to meet the, the um, I, I was attracted more to the art, art scene because of the freedom and the, uh, the hands-on sort of working that uh, Ed Moses and, and Billy L and, and Larry Bell and all those guys. And uh, it, it seemed more, uh, more open, more, more open to ideas. And it was immediate with your hand, you made stuff. And um, I, was, I was really uh, attracted to that when I started in architecture. Um, I didn't come to UCLA to study architecture. Who's, where's that guy? <laughs> <laughs> because there was no architecture school at UCLA. <laughs> the only one was SC. And, um, and I got through it and I, I don't, uh, I have a lot of things I'd like to say about SC that are negative, so I don't want to start it tonight. But, um, but having the, it was comfortable starting out as a as an artist, architect, whatever, and testing the waters without the the press and the and the stuff that was going on. If, if I had been in New York at the same time, the architecture community was so under the glare of, of spotlight. No matter what they did, they were grouped into uh, the whites and the blues and the whatever they called themselves. And, and it was, and they lived so close to each other, they got in each other's faces and, and it was too, too, claustrophobic and LA was more open and I think it it, um, it was uh, inspirational and and uh, it was alive and you could could uh, try things and and grow in it and I still think some of that is still true because uh, uh, there's a big art world out here, but but the uh, you know the movie world is so powerful. The press and all that about that has always overwhelmed everything else, and and so we we it's a big cloud. You can hide behind it, <laughs> and uh, uh, so you don't have to be one of those, <laughs> right? So I think there's a, a that, and I think. Um, there's a special relationship between the West Coast, California especially, and Asia. And, and uh, that was a powerful factor in my personal growth and in the, the evolution of an architectural style here with green and green and, and uh, many others. And because we were building tract houses at the time by the thousands, and it was two by fours, and they were just nailing them up. And, and uh, the, the architects that were teaching the schools had just been to Japan, and they had seen Issei Shrine and uh, Katsura Palace and all those wonderful buildings that were made with essentially small pieces of wood. and beautifully crafted and it was very inspirational. So that aesthetic, uh, 
I mean, if you uh, if you go to Disney Hall someday and and just look at it and think about a Japanese temple, it's there. That stage with everything. I mean, it's 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 in my genes because that's where we started. And uh, the Japan sent the Gaga Ku Orchestra, the Imperial Court music musicians, the first year that. Disney was open and they were sitting on stage and I thought I was in Japan. I, was, so, um, and that's that's something I'm proud of and I think it it uh, it it makes a difference. It's it's about comfort and it's about uh, expression and feelings in buildings that uh, come from a very far away. Example. Wow. Yeah, I would just like to um, just quickly carry on with, first of all, the sheer physical beauty of the state of California. Hello. I'm sorry. Just to be surrounded by that much physical beauty, whether it's a mountain or a beach or a desert, that's just astounding. And to have that range of landscape wherever you turn and to have the light and to have the water, and to have this air. It's unbelievable. So just to basically start with the geography is so thrilling. And again, to start with this gathering of people. Of course, we had the largest population of Native Americans in Native America, the largest number of tribes, the largest number of languages, all of that, which was wiped out. But the actual karma of that is still present and here. And of course, now Los Angeles, in revenge, has the largest Native American population in America. And that's what's cool, is what you regret about the past is being redone right now at this moment in very powerful ways. I would also just underline, for me, one of the thrills of coming here, because I was really sick of the East Coast power structure. I grew up in that. I was trained in that. And there was this, you guys were saying, total orthodoxy there. And to come out here and just have an unorthodox situation where the audience didn't know not to come. They didn't know they would not be interested, so they came. And they were interested. And that was like so exciting out here. And in New York, somebody already said, no, no, we're not interested. And the thrill of just people showing up in this place. And also, I have to say, creativity is about a lot of violence. And the idea that anywhere, any day in LA, someone would just as soon kill you as thank you for your art. You know, the actual sheer level of daily violence of what you have to dodge and deal with and get serious about. And it's one of the most important reasons for me to live in LA is every single day you're up against what you have so failed to solve, what you cannot deal with, what is way more than you are, and you are challenged every single day in this city to get real. And, and the city itself doesn't have any easy, cliched, feel good gestures. Every single thing in this city is, what are you doing? <laughs> and, and, and for me, that reminds you every day, when you wake up as an artist, there's stuff to do. And anything you've done to this point is so not good enough. And what are you waiting for? Thank you. It's interesting to listen to Peter Sellers talk about the challenges of being in Los Angeles while helicopters are putting out a fire um, a, a, a couple of blocks away. Um, so we've talked about what it means to be a Californian in, in California. Uh, you, you, you've all had experiences in other countries. I know uh, Judy studied muralism in Mexico and did, we were just talking about some work uh, in El Salvador and I know sh her works have shown in in, in Canada, uh, Frank is, is from Canada, has done works on just about every continent, maybe something coming in Antarctica soon. Uh, but other than that, all the other continents, I assume. Peter spends a lot of time abroad, Salzburg uh, in particular. Uh, what does it mean to be a Californian abroad? What does it mean to be a Californian when you're somewhere else? I, I've discovered since November of 2016 when people ask me, where I'm from, I scream, uh, I'm from California, much more quickly than I, than I did before. Um, what, is, what does it mean to you, to all of you, to be a Californian when, when you're elsewhere? 
Well, step one, yes, everybody dreams of California everywhere. And you know, you, you're going to a wedding in Uzbekistan and they're singing Hotel California. You know, it's like crazy, but it's like California is everywhere and it's a dream state. But the difference this year is you. The difference is when the entire world was just shocked and horrified by the direction this country, I don't think the country actually took that direction, but that's a longer story. But just to say, when the state of California stepped up right after the election and answered back, when the state of California has made it clear on environmental issues, on a whole range of issues, and if I may say, that is your office, it is very powerful to be from California at this moment. And people all over the world say, thank God you're from California and you people spoke up. I'm now, when I'm elsewhere in America, I feel a little guilty because we can't help. Like, we're... We're so locked out. We're doing pretty well. But abroad, people are so grateful for the stance California has taken in this last year. And uh, more power to you. Yeah, we're proud of you. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I do go around the world and 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 meet with some crazy people, but um, I think uh, and I, I, when I talked about Japan, I left out Mexico, of course, which is a big influence. But um, I think people are, think of California as a, as a place where they're going to eventually get to that <laughs> they've got to get here somehow <laughs> uh and and uh they want to know more about it and uh i think they envy us maybe but um i don't know Do uh, uh, there's so many ways to answer that in terms of how people perceive us um, I just, it, what comes to mind is this sort of interesting story about the founding of my organization, uh, 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 SPARC, the uh, Social and Public Art Resource Center, that is now 44 years old and was founded by three women artists. Uh, uh, and one of the women was Arthur Schlesinger's daughter. And she was, uh, she is, you know, the great American historian. And um, she was in Boston one day in California dreaming came on the radio and she said, I'm going to California. And she joined a mural crew and ended up in East Los Angeles with me. And that's how Spark was founded. That was one of the ways that we were founded. So Calif people do California dream and it's like a, there's that part of it. And I, I actually, for the last 30 years, I have spent a good deal of time in Canada and British Columbia. And that for the reason that I have been very interested in, like the absolute opposite of LA's confrontationalist, um, the hostility, the the um, the violence, the noise, and in that I've 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 lived on a on an island, and on this island people live with a zero footprint, uh, and they are really interested in absolute preservation and a relationship to the environment that is completely different. And it changed my sensibility tremendous, and I tried tremendously. I tried to carry that back to to uh, to Los Angeles and to California, um, and uh, so that's been a really interesting thing to go back and forth. They keep right now. People are saying to me in Canada, "What is going on down there? What is going on? Have you lost your minds?" And so I'm I'm able to you know talk back to that. And um, the, the third part of this is to say that, you know, I travel back and forth to Mexico. So I, you know, I spend a lot of time going back and forth. And, and what I'm seeing right now, and most recently in work that we've been doing in a small village in Oaxaca, is that we are influencing now the, the Chicano, the Mexicano, the Latino population of, of California is influencing Mexico to the degree that you're looking at the iconography going back 
and you know, like, I mean, in a small village in Oaxaca, I'm looking at raiders' hats, and you know, and uh, the, and their tennis shoes, and they're. It's not just the the sort of fashion, but also it's affecting the arts, so that those young people are who are making murals, who are bringing up the mural form again in Mexico, which in fact had been abandoned, are re re resurrecting it, but they are being influenced by Chicano muralists. They're beginning, it's gone, you know, it's like, we call it, I like to call it blowback. You know, in other words, all of my early studies were understanding the Mexican power of the of, of Los Tres Grandes and the, the Mexican mural movement that affected us here, but now it's the reverse. It's like we're going back and forth, and there is this dialogue that is so powerful across that border, and no wall, no matter how tall it is built, or how long it is, is created, will ever not be permeable to both our intellectual uh, communication and into our physical communication. Good, good time, good timing to be talking about Mexican muralism, which we were talking about the backstage. Uh, I know you, you went to Mexico early in your career to study Mexican muralism. I was in Mexico City about two weeks ago, and we had a meeting with uh, the Minister of, of Education. And when you work in government buildings, as I do, in the United States, you have an image of what you're walking into. Uh, I walked into the Minister of Education's uh, uh, office, his main office. It's in a building, uh, was built in 1530. Uh, it was a home for uh, the Spanish governor. It's later a customs house. Um, there was Anguiano murals, Siqueiros murals, a Rivera mural. A little, little different from uh, my Reagan office building on, on Spring Street in downtown LA. And at first I had this sort of moment of Incredible, sheer jealousy, and I thought, oh, why can't we have buildings like that here, government buildings like that here in the U.S.? And then I, I started to think a lot about about the WPA and the the, the uh, federal arts projects uh, that occurred during the Great Depression, for initially as an opportunity to to put pe people to work. But I know Peter's talked about this too. But eventually, they became this incredible uh, program that gave life, gave birth to so many great artists, so many great buildings. Um, and I think what was interesting is that both the Mexican, Mexican muralism from a governmental perspective, which was, um, became sort of popular after the, the revolution and an attempt to kind of build a, a collective Mexican sense of identity, and the WPA project was an attempt to kind of put people to work and create a sense of uh, collective identity uh, uh, outside of economic class, probably, but both of which to an extent were self-serving by the government, but again gave birth to, to this moment, again, this incredible moment when, when arts, arts began to flourish. Um, I want, wanted to get your thoughts on Mexican muralism and if, if perhaps this might be a moment, and Peter as well, since I know he's talked about this, if this might be a moment where we can see some other sort of flourishing. Oh, I, well, I, I, I think it's, it's a wonderful question because um, it is, uh, when Obama was elected, there was a moment in which we, a group of activist artists were invited to come to the, to the White House. And so we all trooped there and we, we had a plan and the plan was to propose the WPA and to say, you need to put another works progress group into place, uh, you know, violins uh, and shovels, uh, uh, you know, plumbers' wages, all the kind of concepts that, um, that were part of the WPA. And, um, you know, George Biddle, who wrote to Roosevelt and said, I'm down here in Mexico, I'm seeing Diego Rivera doing this work, and uh, we need to do this. We need to, you know, uh, put artists to work at plumbers' wages. And uh, of course, that was a flourishing that, uh, that, that we still have many of these examples uh, here in Los Angeles and all across the country. We're, we're losing a, a set of them right now in post offices that are disappearing, right? Um, but I think it is a, it's a wonderful time to think about how artists can 
be citizens, can be part of the civic dialogue. And I think it's very important because that, as Frank was talking about freedom, the place that where people can speak without impunity, where they come from their heart and they come from their experience, is really in the arts. And I think that you know, both in theater and both in visual arts and, and in poetry and, and a kind of program that would give artists the agency to be doing that kind of work again, to talk about what is really democracy. What does it really mean to be an American? What is our common identity that we hold together, that we hold sacred between us? And why, for example, is it important for us to recognize this, uh, uh, all of these people from different backgrounds and different places? And, and why, for example, white supremacism, uh, supremacism is really not possible in America, in this country of immigrants. It's not something that can be ignored or allowed. And I think the artists are the people who can do that work. I mean, there's much more to say about you know, public, public art. Uh, public art flourishes when there is support, and it has to be done with government support. It has to be done with the, the capacity to have access to the kind of spaces that uh, are public spaces. And um, I think that's critical for there to be partnerships between government and artists to carry that out. So I just have an issue about muralists. Uh, Roscoe was my favorite because his, his images and paintings in a building were of a scale that challenged the building, play, played with the scale of the building. Uh, Diego Rivera made the smaller figures, and they were they were overwhelmed by them. So they were a painting on a wall in the building, but they never in, really engaged the architecture like Orozco did. And and I don't see many people uh, doing that. I've, we've, I tried to get somebody to I tried to get David Hockney to do that in Disney Hall, but. <laughs> He didn't want to sit on a scaffold. <laughs> I, I have to, I, I would respond to that because I think uh, it's really what you're talking about is the sort of stacking of imagery that uh, Diego Rivera did. Um, Siqueiros, for example, and David Artaro Siqueiros was using the architecture and re doing a, a relational work to architecture that was really powerful. But we have no schools that train muralists. We don't actually put any work one of the big problems that I have is like, uh, where do we train these muralists? Uh, it, here at UCLA, I teach muralism, and um, I, uh, it's sort of like a, an adjunct to uh, through World Arts and Cultures and Chicano Studies. But really, the kind of courses that we need is to put back into the public um, access is courses that teach the relationship to architecture, that understand architecture as being one of the central elements of the making of a mural. So you're, you're right about that. That struggle is one well, that is still I'd like ongoing. To see more of yeah. uh, you know. And I would just add one last thing, which is most Americans do not associate work and creativity, because their work has no creativity in it. And we have managed to make work simply drudgery and mind-numbing, and most people are absolutely insulted by their daily jobs. Their intelligence, their feeling, their range of imagination is every single day insulted. So what does it mean to put content back into work, meaning back into work, purpose back into work, and feeling, feeling <laughs> into work? And so for me, the WPA is, it's nice to have something in a post office, yes, but it's also crucial that the population feels creative and that we realize that what it means to be human is to be created every, creative every day, and particularly now in our history, we are so deeply dug in on the wrong end of so many questions, and the only way we can pull the car out of the ditch, turn around, and retrace our steps is going to be creative. The solutions are going to be creative solutions, not returning to anything, right? Because actually most of the things we're facing were never, ever done well. So I don't want to get nostalgic for the 70s. I don't want to, at all. For me, a bunch of things have never been good. 
and it is really time to move them forward with maximum level of creativity. And that means the population feels empowered to be creative and that we are putting creative solutions at the head of the list instead of all the way in the back. So that idea of a culture of creativity is, I think, the most important thing you can so, give people. Uh, the co our colleges and universities are built in horse historicist style. And um, so yeah. it's, it's saying to, it's, the message it's giving is, uh, we're preparing you for the future, but we don't know how to do it, so. <laughs> and we have this fake example of the past. <laughs> but, but the thing is, if you look at those, if you look back to the historical precedents, there, nothing we invent is new. Never is. So we're, we need to be cherry picking the parts of things that worked and actually reapplying them. And, and, and coming up with creative solutions. And I, I really totally applaud that. And I think most universities are 30 years at least behind in terms of their teaching. Uh, it's a, Peter talked about nostalgia. And Frank and I have talked a lot about architecture. And I, I know one of the things you said that most offended you at the, what, at the sort of apex of postmodern architecture was the, the, the the nostalgia, the glorification of the past. And I asked you about, I don't know if you remember this, I asked you once about fish, why you like the image of the fish so much. And you said, if postmodernists were so uh, interested in the past, I'm going to go all the way back. Uh, so it was, a, it was a reference to evolution. And um, do, you, do you want to talk about that at all? <laughs> well, they, it was, uh, <laughs> there was a show that they had Museum of Modern Art on uh, Beaux-Arts. It was a beautiful show that um, Drexler was the director at the time. And it was very seductive. And modernism, all of those architects, were, modernism was a dead end. It was starting to look cold and lifeless. and The developers were bastardizing it and making it e even worse. And and so they didn't know where to go. And, and uh, this beautiful renderings of Beaux-Arts buildings was very seductive. And almost like in a, whew, in a week, <laughs> the charge <laughs> was on. And Philip Johnson did AT&T with the, the Chippendale roof. And, um, and everybody started doing it. And I was at a lecture. I had to give a talk. And, and uh, I looked around at all of that stuff. And I said that, that Greek architecture was anthropomorphic. And uh, if they really felt they had to go back, into the past, why don't they go back 300 million years before that, before men, and to fish? And that just came out of by accident. I didn't plan that. It was one of those things you say. And then I started drawing fish, and I started thinking about it, and I, I real, realized that I, I'd fallen into a, a how do you re place ornament and what 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 does give scale to a building and I the fish uh, I was looking at the drawings of Hiroshiga and uh, and started looking at, at at fish and realized that they were architectural they had a they expressed movement it, their forms express movement. We're living in a world of movement, airplanes, cars, and everything. And is it possible that the expression of movement in the architecture could supplant the decoration and give feeling to the buildings? So that's where I went with it, and it led to a few funny buildings. But <laughs> So it's fishy. It's a fish story. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for the funny buildings. Um, 
Uh, I was supposed to announce like 20 minutes ago that people should pass their cards to the aisle, but then I got caught up listening to everybody. Um, I want to ask Peter about one of uh, his favorite speeches. I read a speech that you gave. I read it a long time ago. Um, it was a speech where you were talking about the new century, which hadn't yet started now. We're, we're 18 years in. Uh, it was a speech that you gave in Adelaide, Australia. And it was a beautiful quote. When I was sworn in as speaker, we, they asked me to put up four quotes uh, around the rotunda in Sacramento. I, I picked an Andy Warhol quote. I picked a Grail Marcus quote. I picked uh, the I, uh, Irish revolutionary James Connolly quote. And I picked the quote that, that you, you gave uh, at that speech. And one of the things you said uh, during that speech was um, you were talking about the 20th century and how it had been so absorbed in psychology and the self. And you said, psychology is argu arguably the least interesting thing that is going on in one's life. Reducing your life to your own psychological problems is to devalue your place in history, and it's to devalue your political commitments. You shouldn't say things. I'll remember them. Uh, psychology uh, devalues your place in history and your political commitments. And it's to devalue what we're all doing here for each other. I'm going to ask you about that. But Judy gave a speech not long ago. Uh, that I also saw, and she said, I don't want to be an artist who's simply looking at my own self-expression and examining my own internal workings. And I thought they were all quite similar. And obviously, as an architect, Frank, you ha are always considering the world outside of yourself. You can't be self-consumed. You have to be wondering uh, what other people are thinking and how they're interacting and uh, with the world around them. So I. I guess I wanted to ask uh, first, Peter, 18 years into the new century, are, are we doing any better at, at obliterating the self? Are we doing any better at, at thinking about each other rather than uh, navel gazing? Well, if the economy continues to decline, yes. Uh, you know, just, just less available shopping, that will be good. But, but actually, you know, again, for me, when you talk about uh, California exceptionalism, you know, for me, we have here three very special, very special things that set us apart. We have the world's largest prison system. We have more people in prison in California than China or during Mao Zedong's time or Stalin. And it's here right now. We have the world's largest homeless population here in the city of Los Angeles. And we have the most severe water shortage. And those are three huge things for our generation to really deal with and face. And to me, what snaps you out of yourself is when there's nothing to drink. What snaps you out of yourself is when you realize you're living in one of the world's most appalling gulags. What snaps you out of yourself is you realize there is stuff way beyond whatever you're worried about that needs our best ideas and our full shoulder to the wheel. And it's not going to wait. It's already way past due that these things are dealt with. We inherited them. But they have to be turned around because it is a human catastrophe. And so. The beauty of California also carries this simultaneous set of issues for our generation that, again, you can't be smug. You can't be self-congratulatory. You've got to get out there. And it's urgent. And that urgency is, for me, one of the most important reasons to live in California. Judy, any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, I, I think I totally want to underscore what Peter says, and I think that, um, and that, I, I, I wrote something once about, you know, what a mural was, and I was trying to talk to muralists who were doing these um, increasingly works that were empty, increasingly big, beautiful girls' faces, right, one after the other in spray can, and that, that what had happened is sort of, 
as, as funding disappeared and as support disappeared and teaching disappeared, we got, the, we got more and more vacuous imagery. Um, and what I was trying to say to the young people was I, I said, a mural is a work made in relatedness, made related to the architecture in which it's placed, related to the people for whom it's made, and that the greatest moment before a muralist is being able to pass a brush from one hand to the next without a seam in those movements, and that it was a choreographed dance, you know. So I was talking about that, you know, notion of movement and rhythm and how that works. And I think, I think the arts are that place, the place in which we can actually see ourselves in relatedness to people because we're, our work is not complete until there's an audience for it, until there are people using the, the building that Frank has, you know, they're standing in awe in Disney Hall and, and, and hearing the sound and of, the, of, of the music that comes from that place. And we're getting to see and feel that work of art. Um, my hope is that when people walk the history of the Great Wall step by step, you feel the story of the history of America, the history of the contributions made by immigrant people, by women, by native people, by African Americans, and you see it move through time. And that's, that's the, it, it, it's a physical and emotional travel. So I, I honestly think if we are working in this particular time, it is impossible in California not to recognize that we are a state that provides food to the world, that the farm workers who are harvesting that are being pesticided, and that the pollution is growing in that Central Valley, that we're building more prisons than any other place and detention centers, um, that you know the largest women's prison, for example, is in Merced. I mean, all of these things are part of what affects the color on my brush and the thought I have as I make a piece of work. And um, I think that's, that's being an artist of this time. And these, we cannot ignore the most important issues of our time as we are makers. And if I can just say art is about activism, it's about, you know, if there needs to be more red over there, put more red over there. <laughs> like, don't like have a crisis, just get the red paint out. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> if it needs to be done, do it. <laughs> uh, Frank, Peter, and Judy both talked about our, our prison population. I know you've been doing quite a bit of work on, on, on incarceration lately. And you want to talk about that a little bit? I, I find that really interesting. I got pulled into something. I'm not sure I wanted to get pulled into. Um, I just had a meeting earlier about it. Um, the kids drop out of the elementary schools here in in the U.S. in in big numbers. In in California, there are over 300 schools where the dropouts are fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And a lot of those kids end up in prison. And I've been going to the prisons um, just to see what it, what it is. What, what, and you meet a 50, 60 year old prisoner who's fourth grade or fifth grade education. That's it. They're there. Um, the system seems to, when they, a lot of it, I mean, there are certainly violations of, against us that deserve uh, incarceration. And, and uh, there are many ways for people to, to handle that. And, we traveled through Scandinavia to some of the prisons there and saw the, how they do it. They've got a much smaller prison population and they work very hard at 
bringing people back into the into the working culture, even even uh, people who've committed murder, and uh, they treat them as as human beings. Um, our our prisons. If you go to the I went to a ladies' jail in Watts. Uh, the cells are the cells with bunk, bunk, and a thing in the middle, so they're pretty tight. And they have uh, six bunks on each side, so one of those cells has 12 women in it. The top one is close to the ceiling where there's a fluorescent light that's on 24 hour 24 7 so that person has to do something to sleep and the 12 women have one toilet and if that isn't demeaning for I mean if you uh, and when you walk into the prison when somebody from the outside walks into the prison uh, with a guard but the Inmates have to turn their back to the wall, so it's every everything is to make them feel nothing like nothing. Um, so I don't know what we're going to do about it, but it's a big it's a big issue. And if they're privatized, like Trump wants to do, it's going to be even worse. Uh, we had a discussion with some of the uh, uh, staff at one of the jails, and after a little while, they let their hair down and talked. And uh, San Diego, they said, has a prison built for 800 inmates, and it only has 400. And they were worried that that could mean a decline and affect their jobs. So there's <laughs> two sides. <laughs> and you hear that kind of stuff and just, um, but basically you're not treated like a human being. I don't know if any of you have experienced it, um, being pulled over and handcuffed and put in, but it's, it's hair raising. Thank you. I think we have time to ask each of you about one one of your specific works that I that I wanted to chat about, and then we have time for some questions as well. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Judy about the Great Wall of Los Angeles, and it was you started that work in the early to mid '70s. It was a time the Cold War, the Vietnam War, locally, the Chicano Moratorium, um, recently did a restoration of the work. Um, I guess the question is, how was the work influenced at that time, and perhaps more relevant to now, what do you, how do you think it might be different if you were to do that work today? I think uh, it was 1974, um, and which was just a few years after the uh, largest public works project in America ended. And that was the concreting of the Los Angeles rivers. And uh, those, the, as the rivers were completed, um, as a kid, I was growing up alongside of one of these, we call them the, the, the washes. And the washes were open spaces. And in, in the absence of parks in some of the inner city areas like uh, uh, Pacoima where I was uh, living. Um, uh, only fa uh, people know it because of Richie Valens' movie La Bamba. I, I grew up with Richie Valens. <laughs> he was in my neighborhood uh, in Chich Marin. You know, that's, that's, where, that's where Pacoima is. Um, and there were these washes that were open spaces. When they became concreted, uh, we had all kinds of problems. The problems were the water went too quickly to the ocean, it carried more pollution. And I saw those areas turn to concrete and watched kids get washed down the channel because there's no place to, to get out once you, you know, we were used to playing in them. So 
every year there were children falling in the washes and getting washed down the river. Um, so I had a particular rage about that wash um, as it was concreted. And uh, I couldn't, you know, I thought about, what do you do about that? I mean, you like blow it up and that's terrorism and you go to prison, right? You, uh, you, uh, uh, you, you go to city meetings and try to get them to change it, that's not a chance because really the developers were controlling everything and when you couldn't lose a piece of property, uh, it was about the protection of real estate. So I thought, okay, when the Army Corps of Engineers finished the building project, they went, like, unlike God, they, they didn't say this in the seventh day, and this is good. They went, oh my God, what have we done, right? We have these dirt belts on either side. We've divided up communities, you know. And so they, they, they do whatever they always do, which is to do a Band-Aid, you know. And I was running the city's mural program, and they said, will you paint it? And I looked at it, and I thought, oh, terrible sight to paint. And it has been a terrible sight for the last 35 years that I've been painting it. Incredibly hot. A cooking place. I mean, you get, go down there with, with kids, and you're, you know, you're cooking in the heat. Um, but it gave me an endless wall, a wall that went forever, and that could be painted in a sequence. One, time one summer after the next. And like a test tube, it was possible to bring people from all the different territories, because Los Angeles was divided between you know, racial territories and gang territories. And the wash was a place that was neutral and set apart. You descend 13 and a half feet below ground level, and it was another world, a completely different world. And in that world, we could make something different in which we could tell our stories. Do I think it would be different today? No. It would be the same piece, and it would be perhaps more augmented with augmented reality, so you could hold up your cell phone and Paul Robeson could speak, right? We're getting there, we're gonna do that. Um, it, would, it would be a story that, um, uh, I, I think the process that we developed became a public practice a process that has been refined became a giant educational project. And I started by trying to kind of get even with the river. Yes, I was mad at the thing, right? And then I fell in love with the people I was working with. And what can sustain you for that long is love, but not, not the rage, right? I'm, you know, you can't rage forever, so you, it started to be love. And I think um, I have had the great grace of having young people I've worked with grown up and now their children come about and their children and a, a, a kind of a long history of over uh, of hundreds really of hundreds of people who work with me on the creating of the Great Wall. So the story is I got mad at the river and um, I wanted to speak back to what was the disappearance of the stories of ethnic people and of people of color who had contributed to the building of a nation and I wanted to tell that other story. And um, it, it became a snowball, and it just kept going. And it hasn't ended yet. We're on the 60s and 70s, and I'm really excited about the new pieces that will be occurring. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out a way that we don't have to paint in the river, that we'll be working on substrates and applying to the river and maybe not dying in the heat. Last summer we were there, it got to 118 degrees. So. Speaking of the river, uh, <laughs> there you are, Frank. Uh, there's a, a joke in, in Sacramento that if we had a drinking game, every time I brought up the LA River, everybody would be drunk all the time. Um, I bring up the river constantly. Frank and I are obsessed with the river, both of us. We, we spend uh, way too much of our time together talking about the river. Why, why is it so important to you, and, and why now? Well, uh, I think it was our mayor that moved here. Sorry. <laughs> I was getting comfortable. <laughs> uh, I got called by, the, I never really got down in the river, and I passed through it over the years and looked at it, but 
and I saw things getting pulled away from, uh, and it looked dangerous, so I never went down there. I'll take you, Frank. Huh? <laughs> I'll take you. <laughs> yeah. uh, but this guy, the mayor, called me and said, uh, New York has a, a high line, and they just made a lot of dough making the high line, and it's changed some of the districts it goes through, and it's been a very positive, had a very positive effect on the uh, part of New York. And we've got this 51 miles of river. Uh, could you look at it and tell me what we can do with it? And I looked at him kind of, I said, well, the High Line is a, a steel rusted bridge that's derelict and that nobody cares about. And they might have torn it down, but somebody decided to plant some plants on it and put a walkway on it and made it pretty. I said, I think the LA River is a flood control project and might have other issues to deal with. So uh, I, I then took a serious look at it and got into it, and, and I'm not going to go into all the detail because it was three years of, of uh, volunteer work. Uh, pretty exciting, but trying to figure out what you could do with it. There's a lot of people in the, that want to make it into recreation and use it for habitat and recreation, and there were serious projects doing that and uh, but we checked the whole thing and found out that uh, there's big health issues there's water reclamation issues there's uh, a lot of issues related to the river that that need to be to be addressed it goes through uh, uh, Rendon's district and that district has, uh, we've been meeting with some of the mayors and people and they say, they tell me that uh, their kids have a 10 year lo shorter lifespan because they have no open space. They, they live in these places and, and um, we need some parks. We need uh, clean, cleaner, grounds and all and if you list all the health issues and and the cost of to the taxpayer of those health issues it's in the billions and water reclamation is in the millions and could be in the billions so uh, there is an, an economic reality that we're wasting and then there is this dream of using this 51 miles for kayaking and, and uh, all kinds of, of uh, stuff, recreational stuff, and also to uh, grow habitat, for, so froggies and, and fishies and all those kind of nice things. Um, and it's disarming because the the all the data says that the flooding part only happens two percent of the time. So when you look at that, you know if you came into it like I did, oh, two percent of the time we can handle that, no problem with that. Uh, you know, that's easy until we found out that if you plant grass in the bottom of the, like everybody wants to put trees and stuff in, so just simply plant a layer of grass in the flat bottom, when the 2% thing happens, the flood spreads out five times the width of the channel because of the grass. So then that means that there are many homes at risk for flood. And the Corps just published, a, they finally came out and admitted that there was an issue and, and that um, 
I warned people that their houses were, were going to be, could be flooded and that they should take out flood insurance. That was last October that was published in the LA Times. So that's why. <laughs> Uh, once you get in it, you're caught because there's so much stupidity related to it and so much folklore and and really, I mean, the people that have been promoting uh, habitat and and uh, landscape and and all those wonderful things in the river are some of the nicest people and some of them are good friends of mine and some of them are you know, they're really committed to doing that kind of stuff, but they somehow everybody just looked at the 2% thing and said, well, it's not going to be a big deal. Well, <laughs> well Godzilla is a big deal. <laughs> so that's why we're working. And the county owns that land. So uh, it's, it's it's in one entity, and so to do something with it, it's it's kind of politically maybe easier, and so we've and and I particularly wanted to focus on the on Speaker Rendon's area, not because just because of him, but uh, because that's where the there's a, a serious need right now. And uh, we think we could we can make make a difference there and create uh, activities surrounding the river, bringing uh, uh, culture cultural. Uh, we have an opportunity with Gustavo Dudamel, who has uh, been part of the Sistema in Venezuela, which is. One an incredible arts education program, and I've been there many times and witnessed it. And uh, so we're creating a project called Youth Orchestra LA Yola, and uh, we want to move them out into these communities and have concert facilities in there in those communities. They don't have to come downtown to Disney Hall. They can. The kids can the kids can play there, and if the facilities are decent acoustically, they don't have to be fancy. They can. We're, we've done this now in Berlin. We built a concert hall in a warehouse, and it's been very successful. So it, it doesn't have to be fancy stuff, and uh, that'll change the. You know, if you start to do. A, Ten of those things, you can change that community's uh, feelings and face, and and so the speaker has gotten involved with me, and um, I think there's a lot of people interested in it. We've gotten the attention of the water and power water department and the supervisors and. Uh, Jerry Brown told me he liked it, so. Anyway, thanks. The governor often doesn't like stuff, <laughs> so that says a lot. And uh, speaking of arts, I want to publicly acknowledge and uh, thank you, Frank, for your commitment to to my district with respect to arts education. I know it was a you've made personal commitments and and contributions to to arts education in my district, and that's uh, you you did so without being asked and without any fanfare at all, and that says a lot about you, so thanks. Um, I want to ask, yay. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask Peter about his new opera, which I saw in November, I believe, in San Francisco, uh, Girls of the Golden West. Uh, I remember sitting there uh, with my wife Annie and at intermission sort of turning to her and saying, my history classes were never this interesting. Um, it's an opera about uh, the gold rush and the 49ers. Uh, it involves uh, Chinese sex workers, uh, a Mexican woman who 
stabs a man in self-defense who's, who's being harassed. Uh, she, she stabs him in self-defense after being harassed. Native Americans, uh, mostly women. Um, stories about the gold rush that you never hear in, in the history books that I read. Um, incredible stories. And, and if I could take just one more moment. When you hear this dialogue about coming from the president about walls, I, I was thinking recently about one of the most interesting things I think in North America is to go down and to walk along the border and to see a lot of the, the graffiti that people put on the, on the border, on the wall. And it's mostly people who are, who are leaving their homes and going elsewhere. And what always strikes me when I, when I see that, uh, when I read those notes, it's often messages that people are writing either to their home country or their relatives they're, they're leaving behind. And I always think it's in, for an incredibly difficult moment and people who are being pushed to the edge there's an incredible optimism in those messages that they scrawl on the wall, messages that I don't think the president has ever seen or would be open to. And when I saw your opera, what was amazing was that there was a tremendous amount of suffering among these mostly women, uh, women of color, um, again, sex workers and women who were hung. Um, but there's also an incredible optimism about that time. And one quote that you said about the opera is, you said this opera carries the DNA of our period right now. Um, what, what did you mean by that? And, and why this optimism from these people do you think at such an incredible time in our history and in their own lives? Okay, well let's just say, when the going gets tough, pleasure is really important. And that's why the arts, like over and over again, the best art is made in the worst times. Just because people actually need pleasure. People actually need joy. People actually need something that you can't read in the newspaper. People need a whole other layer of their lives to be alive and thrilling. And their senses brought alive again that have been deadened. And we need to just take enormous pleasure in being alive. That's why the arts are here. And, and then you're up for stuff, right? Because if you're doing something you love, working really hard is not hard. If you're doing something you hate, every single bit of work is really hard. And right now, the stuff we have to do, you got to love it. And you got to love that it is that intense. And what we do in opera is people are working really hard. An opera singer is doing something that can only be described as superhuman. You're making a sound that you're on such a level of risk and danger. And you have to bring it off gracefully with a flourish, and it has to be sensational. And that's also why sports are so awesome, is you watch human beings do these astounding things with grace under unbelievable pressure. And that joy that, yes, you're in a really tough spot, and then you come out of it so beautifully, and with the best of what makes somebody human, which the worst times call for. So uh, for me, that opera is, is about taking enormous pleasure in the incredible sacrifices and courage that people made. And creating the state of California was pretty thrilling because this is the first multicultural society in human history. Because when the media empire existed finally by 1849, world went out of gold discovered in California. People came here from Egypt, from Brazil, from Japan, from Australia, from Russia, from Scotland, from you know, you name it, the entire world showed up here, and this was truly the first multicultural society on Earth. And that is such a powerful way to begin a society. And then, of course, it evolved, devolved into such levels of violence and outrage. You know, the fabulous Supreme Court of the state of California 
in the first year, the Supreme Court justice was a 28-year-old kid who one of his first opinions was in order to deprive Chinese people of their rights was to demonstrate that Chinese are in fact Negroes. And this incredible 10-page decision that finds that the Chinese race is Negroid, you know, so that they will not have rights. You know, it's just, so California also had just the, the largest number of outrages and kind of in your face level of outrage. And so, for me, that's super instructive in our state to this day. You know, we have the most amount of progress and promise, and also we have to really measure up to what is actually in front of us. So for me, the, the, what we can offer people right now is pleasure. What we can offer people right now is exhilaration, what we can offer people right now is the actual injustice, we see that all the time, but what would justice be like? What would that feel like? Music can suggest that. Music can take you to a place where equality is not just something that is written on a wall, it's real between people. And what we're talking about is radically shared space. How do we radically share the water how do we radically share the air? How do we radically share everything? And what the 21st century is about is going to be sharing. That's what the whole planet actually has to get good at now. Because we're really good at collecting things for ourselves and our friends. What is the culture of sharing? That's what we actually have to work on. And what's marvelous about California and why the arts are so important in California is California is a dream. It is a moment of idealism in people's lives. This place stands for what could the world be like? And what could it be like if human beings are living in harmony with nature and with each other? And just to add one more <laughs> layer of that opera, yeah, you sing. There's a beat, there's a rhythm, there's a movement. We're not stuck. We're not stuck. And we're seeing images of political paralysis all over the world right now as really aggressive authoritarian regimes move in. And what it means in California not to be stuck and to actually demonstrate here we're not stuck, we're moving, we're moving forward. And again, I congratulate the legislature, please. And just to say, yes, this is time to move. And what we're doing as artists is demonstrating movement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, time for just a couple of real quick questions. Uh, this is for Judy. As a Chicana and a woman, I should have brought my glasses. Uh, how were you encouraged to continue your work in your own voice? And what would you say to my seven-year-old Chicano son uh, to have pride and success in his uniqueness? Well, good question. Um, I, think, I think it's really, there's a well, I guess. I, I would say that there is a well and that well is the source, uh, uh, or, or maybe better is a spring, is a way of talking about it. Um, and that spring has to do with culture. It has to do with your ancestors, uh, your grandparents, um, those who, who taught you and, and your teachers. And that spring is the place from which you draw your inspiration and your capacity um, to make work. And as a Chicana, my, one of my central places of inspiration comes from uh, my grandmother, who was, it turns out in my new DNA test, was Apache. Um, Apache and, 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 of course, Spanish and Mestiza. Um, but I always knew that we weren't uh, the tribe everybody said we were from. And the, the fierceness of the Apache suits me just fine. Um, 
And so that, I, I know that she was a healer and that she, she gave me a teaching that I can go back to repeatedly. So I would say to the young, to the, to the, to the children, to the young boy, that uh, pay attention, find that spring, keep going to that place and drinking and using that as a way of growing. Thank you. Um, I, I'm being yanked. Um, I, uh, when I first uh, joined the legislature in 2012, my, uh, a couple of ex-members and some chiefs of staff who'd been around the building gave me a collection of about 20 books about California government and California politics. I read about two of them. Um, and then uh, I returned to my readings uh, about art, about aesthetic history, aesthetic theory, aesthetic history. I felt like I learned more uh, from artists than I was able to learn from, uh, from the people who'd, who'd worked in the building that, that I've been working in in the past few years. And I think it's because of, because of the creativity that Peter talked about. I think it's the application of, 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 of practical solutions to the lives of real people that Frank talked about, and I think it's because of the, the sense of community that Judy talked about. And I think that's in, inherent in, in all artists, and it's something that, that I've uh, learned from art and, and from artists, and something that I think uh, I'm glad we were able to share together tonight. So I wanna thank Peter, Frank, and Judy for being here. I wanna thank all of you for being here. This has a, been a very special night, and I learned quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you.